In this video, we are going to continue our discussion of differential operators on vector fields, and we're going to talk about the curl. So the curl of a vector field is the gradient operator crossed with a vector field. So this is going to be a similar definition to divergence or similar in the case that we're pretending like an operator can be a vector. So this is going to be the x derivative. This is going to be the y derivative. This is going to be the z derivative. This is f1, f2, f3. Okay, so this is a cross product. This is a vector. And we're going to look at an example below. Okay, so we want to find the curl of this vector field. Okay. So let's just set up the determinant, i, j, k. This is the x derivative operator, the y derivative operator, the z derivative operator. Now this uh, is the x component. So this is gonna be x squared y. Next we have the y component, which is y squared plus z squared. And finally is the z component, which is z cubed minus x squared z. Okay, now this is really a different type of determinant. We already kind of, you know, we already realized that having a determinant with vectors in it is strange. Now we're having a determinant with uh, differential operators in it. Okay, so this is a vector. And the first component is going to be the derivative of, uh, I'm going to, is the derivative of this two by two matrix. I hope you'll be able to see me sort of tracing this out with my cursor. It's the derivative of uh, the, the determinant of this two by two matrix. In other words, it's going to be the y derivative of the z component minus the z derivative of the y component. So the y derivative of the z component is zero and the z derivative of the y component is two z. So this is minus two z. The second component is going to be minus the determinant formed by the outer two columns. So it's going to be the derivative, uh, the x derivative of the z component minus the z derivative of the x component. Now the z derivative, uh, sorry, the x derivative of the z component is minus 2xz, and the z derivative of the x component is 0. And then finally, the last, the, the last entry in the vector is going to be the x derivative of the y component minus the y derivative of the x component. Now the x derivative of the y component is zero. The y derivative of the x component is x squared. So this is minus x squared. And we can simplify this a little bit. Minus 2z, 2xz minus x squared. So this is the curl of the given vector field. And uh, now we want to talk about the, or a physical definition or a physical interpretation of curl. So in theory, the curl of F is only defined in three dimensions. Why? Because you're doing the cross product and the cross product is only defined for three dimensional vectors. However, there's a workaround. If F is a two dimensional vector field, then we can still define the curl of f in the following way. So the curl of a two-dimensional vector field is just going to be the curl of the following vector field. f1, f2, 0. So we basically just add a 0 component. Okay, so this is like if this represented a velocity field, it would be a vector field that had no uh, vertical component. There's only, or no, no upward component. There's only an x and y component. Okay, and so now we want to answer, what is a geometric interpretation of curl? And to do this, I'm going to use Dr. Yaskin's book, but there is a typo in the book that I want you to be aware of. I will mention it when we get to the book, uh, but you're just going to ignore the text that's in the middle of the page. Okay, now forget about this stuff written off to the side. You'll, that will be clear in a moment. Um, okay, so we are dealing with basically a two-dimensional vector field. Uh, this is the discussion that I just gave. F uh, is F1, F2, 0. We turn the two-dimensional vector field 
into a three-dimensional vector field so we can define the curl. And the expression for curl, the curl of f, is just, uh, it just only contains a z component. These are zero. So the curl of f only contains a z component, and that component is the x derivative of f2 minus the y derivative of f1. So let me, let me write that here. So uh, the curl Okay, so the curl of f is equal to 0, 0, the x derivative of f2 minus the y derivative of f1. And all of this stuff right here, the, the pictures and the descriptions do not match up. So ignore this for now until Dr. Yaskin changes it. The pictures themselves are really good. Okay, so What's going on here? So let's look at this diagram. So this is the case where uh, F2 is equal to zero. So the vector field is just F1, zero, zero. And so the divergence is just the Y, the, the divergence, if you come over here, the divergence is just going to be negative the Y derivative of F1. So let's look at what's happening here. So the smaller, the so, Since the vector field only has an x component, it's going to be pointing either to the left or to the right. And since the y derivative is negative, this means that for, for larger negative values of y, the vector field is going to be pointing to the right. And for larger y values, for larger positive values, it's going to be pointing to the left. Or, or at least, I guess the better way to say this would be that as y gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, the vector field is going to push, is going to point less to the right and more to the left. So if it's pointing to the right, it's going to point less and less and less to the right, then it'll, maybe it'll start pointing more and more to the left. Okay, so just think about why this is consistent. The y, der or the, the y derivative of f1, okay? As, uh, as y gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the derivative or the, the f1 gets smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? Meaning it, it goes negative. Okay, so what's happening here, uh, again, this is similar to the picture that we looked at before for divergence. So if you move this ball around, notice that all of these arrows on the ball, no matter where you go, all of the arrows on the ball kind of are all pointing in the counterclockwise direction. Okay, so now in this situation where the vector field is just F1, 0, 0, and the F1, the Y derivative of F1 is less than 0, if you come here, this means that the, uh, the z component of the curl is going to be positive. Okay, uh, now let's come look uh, over here. Um, or sorry, now let's look down here at this one. So here's a different situation. Um, now we have a vector field where f1 is zero and it only has the f2 component. And now the x derivative of f2 is positive. So it's gonna be kind of the opposite of what's going on over here. So the bigger x gets the, the, the uh, bigger the vector field is going in the positive direction. And again, if this represents a velocity field and we look at these arrows on this circle here, notice that there's a counterclockwise rotation here. Okay, and you have some, and notice that if the X derivative of F2 is positive, it means the Y component, or the, sorry, the Z component of the curl is positive. So this is the idea, and I'll let you think about uh, these two pictures over here. So this is gonna be the idea that if, the, the curl is going to tell us uh, how a fluid field is rotating. So if we're dealing in R2, the curl tells us, uh, if the curl is positive, then it tells us that the fluid is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. Or and when I say the curl is positive, I mean the Z component. The Z component of the curl is positive. It means that the vector field is rotating in a counterclockwise direction, meaning if it's a velocity field, the fluid is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. If the Z component of the curl is less than zero, it means that the fluid is rotating in a clockwise rotation. Okay, and this is where we get the right-hand rule from. So, well, this, this is one of the motivations for the right-hand rule. So uh, what we're saying is that, um, okay. Sorry about that. We might hear him again too. 
Okay, so if the Z component of the curl is positive, then it means the fluid is flowing in a counterclockwise direction. If the Z component of the curl is negative, it means the fluid is, uh, is circulating in a clockwise direction. Okay, and so this is the, the fluid velocity interpretation of curl. If the vector field is the velocity field of a fluid, then the curl of the velocity field measures how much the fluid is rotating at each point. The direction of the curl is the axis of rotation, the magnitude of the curl is the rate at which the vector field is rotating, and the direction of rotation is determined by the right-hand rule. So let's think about in the two-dimensional the, the two example, notice that the fluid was, the, the axis of rotation is the z-axis because this is all taking place in the plane, and what is the, what was the direction of the, um, of the curl of a two-dimensional two vector field? Well, it's either pointing up or it's pointing down. Is a vector that's pointing up or pointing down? If it's rotating counterclockwise, it's pointing up. If it's rotating counterclockwise, it's pointing down. So this is one of the, one of the justifications for the right-hand rule. Okay, so that was a discussion of curl. Um, the idea is that curl is equal to the gradient crossed with the vector field. We can define it. It's initially defined in R3, but we can also define it in R2 using the method that we saw. And the geometric interpretation of curl is that it represents the amount that a, that a fluid field is rotating. So if the vector field is the velocity field of a fluid, the curl represents how much the vector field or how much the fluid is rotating 